Hello and welcome to another episode of Talking Naughty with Captain Frank. So today's topic is going to be how to inspect your boat's electrical systems. And by electrical systems, I mean both AC and DC power. I see a lot of problems with uh, AC and DC uh, electrical systems while surveying boats and thought it would be a good topic to uh, bring to the channel and tell you guys uh, how I do my surveys, what I look for and stuff, and what you can look for when you're doing your own uh, inspections. So regular inspection of your boat's AC and DC electrical systems can head off a number of problems, from that flickering chart plotter to a three-alarm fire, while helping to keep your hours uh, on the water boat safer and electrically trouble-free. When's the best time to survey your boat's electrical system? Well, today, right? Whether you've owned the boat for a day or decades, uh, what better way to spend a few hours on board than familiarizing or re reacquainting yourself with some of the most uh, important systems on board? The familiarity an electrical systems inspection provides prepares you for troubleshooting electrical problems when professional help isn't around, which uh, it also in turn increases uh, your self-sufficiency and confidence in your ability to solve problems that crop up while away from the dock. Today's episode is actually the first of a four-part series. The first episode, today we're going to be talking about DC system inspections. The second episode, we're going to be talking about AC power systems. The third episode, that's going to be inspecting circuit breakers and wire runs and installation uh, faux pas that I often see. The uh, fourth episode is going to be onboard charging systems. Now, these onboard charging systems that I'm talking about is going to include battery chargers, inverters, as well as uh, solar and wind power systems. So to get things started off, we're going to start out by saying safety first, right? Well, the inspections and checks that I'm going to mention in this article are geared towards the average boater. Uh, if you have any doubts about the ability to do any of these, you always want to seek the advice of a competent marine electrician, one familiar with the standards and recommendations provided by the National Fire Prevention Association, NFPA, and the American Boat and Yacht Council, which is abbreviated ABYC. To get this party started, DC uh, system inspections, we're going to talk about battery installations. Uh, batteries are the heart of your DC system. Uh, Section E10 of the American Boat and Yacht Council's Standards and Technical Information Reports for Small Craft covers battery installation requirements in great detail. What we're going to do today is we're going to touch on the basics here and problems I commonly see while surveying. Uh, the basic requirements uh, are for the same for each of the more common battery types, wet cell, gel cell, AGM, all the standards and stuff pretty much uh, are going to be the same across the board for these. Now, your newer battery technology, like your lithium, uh, they have their own unique requirements, and that's a topic uh, for a later uh, episode. So, ABYC requires that all batteries be installed in liquid-tight, acid-proof battery boxes or trays. These battery boxes, this is the one you always see when you go to West Marine or any other channel, the plastic battery boxes. And you can buy them based on the size of the battery you have. So, again, you can buy these commercially, but you can also make your own as long as they meet the, uh, the requirements. In other words, liquid-tight, acid-proof. The one thing you have to make sure is if you build your own trays, make sure that the mountain hardware, the bolts and the screws or whatever you use to mount them, doesn't compromise the leak-proof quality of the containers. Another point to remember is, is that the battery trays or boxes, they don't have to be large enough to contain all of the electrolyte in the battery. They only have to be able to contain the spillage due to boil over, for example. Many boat owners fail to include a tray or box with installing AGM absorbed glass mat batteries. They use the logic that, you know, this, the electrolyte is in suspension, it's in the fiberglass, um, and it can't leak out. Well, the standard still applies as they can, you know, they can weep electrolyte if they overheat. But also, I have to remind them that the AGMs that they've got, you know, installed now, these can be replaced with wet cell batteries at some point in the future, either by them or an unwitting new owner that doesn't know that, you know, you have to have trays and stuff. Batteries are also required to be secured against movement, specifically one inch maximum in any direction for at least one minute when exposed to 90 pounds of pull or twice the weight of the battery, whichever is less, right? So just quick, easy, dirty way to remember, no more movement than one inch in any direction. The second thing I often see about, you know, the problems I see with battery installations would be uh, a battery box that uh, is properly secured, yet the battery inside is significantly smaller than the box uh, 
was designed for. This allows excessive movement of the battery inside the battery box. Section E10 also requires that positive terminals be covered to prevent accidental shorting from drop tools, for example. It's another common issue I find. You always want to cover the positive terminal with rubber or plastic you know, terminal caps or the rubber boots you'll see on them or a non-conductive shield. If a typical plastic battery box is used, the one with the lid, then the lid will satisfy this requirement. Another problem I see, lack of proper ventilation. Batteries uh, should ideally be located in a cool, well-ventilated area. In reality, I often see them placed in some of the worst possible areas for this regard. Uh, unvented lockers, uh, build spaces, and of course the hottest area of the boat, the, the engine compartment. Adequate ventilation is critical to remove uh, fumes and gases generated while charging. While keeping the batteries as cool as possible, you know, increases their service life. You know, you keep them cool and, and they're going to have a longer service life. Another requirement, battery terminal connections must provide a secure mechanical and electrical connection. Spring clips and alligator clamps, now you can't use those things. They're not permitted. And one of my personal pet peeves is the use of wing nuts. You know, wing nuts are you know, notoriously difficult to torque properly and they will invariably loosen due to vibration, you know, boat movement, etc. So when I spot wing nuts on a battery during a survey, I always recommend that they be replaced with, uh, you know, stainless steel marine grade nylock nuts, a much better option. In other words, you can torque those things down uh, and it'll keep the battery connections, you know, from coming loose. Thirsty about more battery knowledge? I will post a link in the uh, description below to a couple of articles that I've already written and posted on my YouTube channel that goes into great detail about batteries in general, battery, con you know, battery construction, the types of batteries and stuff like that. And you can look for that in the uh, description uh, below. And on the next talk of with Naughty with Captain Frank, we're going to be going over your AC power system inspections. Stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, and you want to buy Captain Frank a cup of coffee, please click on the thanks button below this video. All tips received, not spent on coffee, will be used to improve my YouTube channel and create even more awesome videos.